Um, so, uh, Pastor and his family. So, if you need anything during the week, uh, I'll be at the church, and so you can call the church office or call me or get a hold of one of the board members, and we can uh, 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 work to figure out whatever it is uh, that you need to talk to us about. But again, so come and bring those things to me or one of the board members this week. I uh, want to let you know several things are going on in our church. You may have seen some of the little uh, sheets that are up. The Journeyman Quartet is going to be here this Thursday at 7 o'clock. And so if you're interested in hearing them, it's, it's free. Just come and, uh, and uh, join and be a part of that and enjoy their music. Um, so we would encourage you if you want to come to that or bring a friend as well, that will be going on. I uh, also want to let you know that uh, this afternoon, uh, following church, our young adults are going to be getting together and uh, d- uh, doing a little float trip here. So if you're a young adult and want to join us, and this is the first you've heard about it, come and talk to me. Or uh, Nick, could you ra- just wave your hand in the back? Nick Shearer back there, he can help you out, give you some of the details if you'd like to join us. Um, we are going to be doing also, uh, on July 27th, our church is doing a community backpack giveaway. You may remember that from previous years. Uh, we, we give haircuts and give out backpacks with school supplies, and we've got some things for the kids. However, we do need some people to help sign up to help out with that. Um, it's, it's on a Saturday, July 27th, and it's, it's a, about a two- or three-hour slot in the morning. Uh, in the back on the table back there, there is a yellow sheet, uh, and that is a sign-up sheet if you would be willing to help with something. And so we would just ask that if you are able that morning, even if it's just to come and just kind of to help supervise, if you could sign up to help with that. We would so appreciate that, and uh, I know the people in the community would also appreciate that as well. Uh, Also, one more thing. I want to let you know that this Friday at uh, 6 o'clock, the ROCs are going to be meeting right here. They're going to be grilling out and uh, just asking that you would bring a side dish or a dessert if you'd like to come. They'll have the meat, and they'll take care of the the main course, but just bring something to share as well. So a lot of things going on in our church. That's a good thing. I believe it's a good thing to be a church that is is active. and so I'm glad to see all the things that are going on. I also, in just a minute, I'm going to have the, uh, the kids come up. There were a kids camp. We had a great week, and God did some really amazing things. And so we just want to share that with you. But before we do, if we could just have our ushers come forward this morning, we will take this morning's tithes and offerings. And so uh, then we will have a chance for the kids to be able to share a little bit. And I know that God really did some incredible things. It's, uh, it's always amazing to see um, when kids come to God and they worship Him and they seek His face, some of the things God does are just incredible. Uh, and uh, just never underestimate what God can do because God works in these kids even from a young age. I know it happened for me, and it's definitely happening with some of our kids. So I praise God for that. Well, let's, let's pray this morning, then we'll take up this morning's offering. Lord, we thank you this morning again, Lord, for your provision and your blessings in our lives. And God, as we give back to you, Lord, it's, um, it's with a joyful heart that we do so, knowing, God, that... Uh, Uh, You are a God who takes care of our every need, and that, Lord, when we give back to you, Lord, that's a way that we can reach others for Jesus Christ. And so we pray today that this offering would be blessed and multiplied in your name. Amen. Amen. Uh, If you were one of the kids who was at Kids Camp, if you could just come to the front this morning so everybody can see who you are. I want to give you an opportunity, if you'd like, to just share real briefly about something that uh, God did in your life at Kids Camp. And uh, I know we had just an awesome, awesome week. Yeah, go ahead and... Go ahead and slide over here, guys. I know we got that communion table, but you got yeah. Go ahead and step up one step so everybody can see. I know some of the people in the back. It might be a little, little bit of a rough angle, but I'll just go ahead and give you guys a chance to share real quickly something that God did in your life, uh, something about kids camp, and uh, then I'll go ahead and wrap it up here. Oh, and and tell them who what your name is in case they don't know who you are. My name is Alexis Slater, and. Uh, I don't really know at the moment. All right. Just so you know, just so you know, I'm putting these kids on the spot, so they haven't had like all day to think about this either. All right. If you think of something, you let me know. Uh, my name is Sammy York, and The parents are saying, when you got home, you wouldn't stop talking, right? Uh, it was very fun, and I faced my fear to going on the zip lines. Yeah. All right. All right. Got on the zip lines, faced your fear. I would like, I would like to add, before we go any, go any further here, and some of these kids might say this, but you would have been so proud to see these kids worshiping God. Um, we had awesome. I, just personally, I love kids' camp worship. 
Um, you think there's, <laughs> you think there's energy in other services. You have not been to a kids camp service. <laughs> energy everywhere, and it was great, great to worship God. And these kids were jumping right in. Yeah. Can we do all the verses? Yes, yes, we'll come back to you. Oh, oh, you want to do the verse? Okay. Does everybody want to do the verse? Okay. We, all right, yeah, let's, let's, let's do this, because this is really cool. While we were at kids camp, uh, the, the lady who was the wife of the, the main guy, Stephanie, we called her Super Chica, all right, uh, challenged the kids that they could learn an entire chapter of the Bible during kids camp. And wouldn't you believe it, they did it, all right? So I know it's been a couple of days here, but if you guys think we can pull it off, we will try it in front of the church here. If, if, we, if we lose it, I mean, bear with us. This is a whole chapter. All right, you guys, you guys ready? Okay. All right. That puts me on the spot, too. I'm glad we did well. I'm glad we did well. Five out of six verses, pretty good. Pretty good. All right. Absolutely. Uh, back, if you have something else you would like to share, go ahead. Okay. I'm Samantha Eberly, in case you didn't know me, and I was called to be a missionary there at church camp. I felt it that I really needed to be a missionary and go help um, other kids in different countries and different towns and states and stuff and people prayed for me so that I would be able to speak in tongues and receive the Holy Spirit and they said that I did but there were many distractions so I wasn't able to speak in tongues that night but they said I did um at camp God just blessed me I felt real good he I really feel weird right now. <laughs> we had a good week. We had a good week. And I can tell you, like I said, I can tell you that these guys, they, they were praying at the altar and worshiping God and that kind of stuff. So it was, it was very good. My name is Peyton Meek, and I don't really know what I did at camp. <laughs> um, Shay from work. I don't know me. Um, I had lots of good food at camp. Um, I didn't go on the zip lines. Um, go in the dark dodgeball is pretty fun. Our uh, our other counselor Lee, he um, taught us a strategy of standing on our line and not not backing down and just staying there. And we we really dominated. Yeah. All right, hey, let's give it up for the kids. You guys can go ahead and take a seat. You go ahead and take a seat. You know, I feel like there is some spiritual parallel to that, honestly, what Chapin was just sharing. And it's true. We found that the best strategy in dodgeball is you get to the front lines and you don't back down even if you don't have a ball because then they're pinned against the wall. There's nothing they can do. You win the game. 
And I thought about that a little bit, and I was kind of like, you know, there's a little bit of spiritual parallels there because how often do we find ourselves, we're retreating from the enemy, like run, fall back, fall back. And if we stand at the front lines and we attack and we, we go after God instead of trying to run away from all the, you know, afraid of what the enemy can do, when we're seeking after God and moving towards the front lines, we find that we find victory. So um, anyway, there was a little bit of a spiritual parallel there as well, so. But anyway, yeah, like I said, the kids had a lot of fun. There were zip lines, go-karts, glow-in-the-dark dodgeball. At the end of the day, like I said, I, um, I'm sure for a lot of these kids right now, it's just a blur. I'm still recovering. Uh, it was a crazy week. But at the same time, uh, it was so cool just to experience, just being worshiping, um, going after God, seeing God do great things at the altars, kids filled with the Holy Spirit, uh, being called into into ministry and so it was just a fantastic experience and so I want to say a special thank you especially to all those who helped in in raising our money for camp I know that that came in handy both with the teenagers and with the kids and we were able to really discount the rates and so um, I'm just so appreciative of all you guys have done to support and in prayer uh, because it was worth it it was a great week and so thank you so much for that Hi, good morning. morning. You you know, sometimes it is a little difficult to really explain what God does in a man's life internally. But yet, you know it's there and you know it's incredibly real. And you see the effects of it and it never leaves you, amen? Amen. Well, are you ready to get into God's Word this morning? Turn with me, if you would, this morning to Deuteronomy chapter 20. And what we're going to look at here this morning are the four different kinds of soldiers that Moses describes in Deuteronomy chapter 20. We're going to read the first 12 verses here. He says, when you go to war against your enemies and see horses and chariots and an army greater than yours, do not be afraid of them because the Lord your God who brought you up out of Egypt will be with you. When you are about to go into battle, the priest shall come forward and address the army. And he shall say, Hear, O Israel, today you are going into battle against your enemies. Do not be faint-hearted or afraid. Do not be terrified or give way to panic before them. For the Lord your God is the one who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to give you victory. The officer shall say to the army, Has anyone built a new house and not dedicated it? Let him go home or he may die in battle and someone else may dedicate it. Number two, has anyone planted a vineyard and not begun to enjoy it? Let him go home or he may die in battle and someone else enjoy it. Number three, has anyone become pledged to a woman and not married her? Let him go home or he may die in battle and someone else marry her. Then the officer shall add, is there any man who is afraid or faint-hearted? Let him go home so that his brothers will not become disheartened too. When the officers have finished speaking to the army, they shall appoint commanders over it. When you march up to attack a city, make its people an offer of peace, and if they accept and open their gates, all the people in it shall be subject to forced labor and shall not work for you. But if they refuse to make peace and they engage you in battle, then lay siege to the city. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, what we see here is such a clear description, God, of what can go on, Lord, when you're called to a battle line, Lord. It is so easy to get distracted, Lord Jesus. It's, it's so easy to, to not have your head or your heart in the, in, in, in the game and in the battle. And God, help us to understand this morning, Lord Jesus, that more than anything, God, you want our head and our heart, God, into this battle that you've called us to. And God, help us to understand, too, Lord, that this battle, Lord, that you've called us here to, Lord, that, Lord, losing is not an option. God, understand, God, help us grasp again, God, that there are eternal souls, God, eternal souls, God, that are attached 
to whether or not we win this battle or lose this battle. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. You know, in Deuteronomy chapter 20, what Moses does here is he describes the four different kinds of soldiers that you will always find on the battlefield, some of which who are very focused and very committed, and others who are very distracted by whatever is going on around them at the time. And if you break this text down, starting at verse 5, the order of sequence goes something like this. Starting in verse 5, you have a soldier that builds a house and wants to go back home and enjoy it. He's understandably disconnected. In the next verse, you have a soldier that plants a vineyard and he feels cheated. He never got to enjoy the fruit of his own labor. And again, he's understandably disconnected. And in the next verse, you have a soldier that took a wife and he's yearning yearning for her companionship, hoping she does not find someone else. And again, he's understandably disconnected, isn't he? And then you have a soldier who is what what Moses describes as weak or faint-hearted. And God says if you leave him in the battlefield, the fear that is in his heart will affect everyone else around him. And God says, let him go home, let them all go home. And what God is trying to communicate here very clearly is that none of these men are going to come through you in the heat of the battle because their heart is not in to fighting the battle. They are preoccupied, they are unfocused, and if you want to win a war, you're not going to win a war with soldiers like that. You've got to have a group of guys that have their head in the game and their heart in the battle. Because when the battle is raging, let me put it to you this way. You know a good soldier, a good soldier doesn't just protect himself. He's looking out for the guy next to him in the battlefield, right? You know, I heard a guy say one time, if you ever see a turtle sitting on top of a fence fence post, you know he probably didn't get there by himself, right? Somebody helped that turtle get there. And you know, I uh, I took my daughter to see the Lone Ranger last week. And you know, even the Lone Ranger has Tano, didn't he? Don't ever forget, ladies and gentlemen, that we all piggyback on the accomplishments of people who have uh, went before us. And a battle is not won by lone rangers. A battle is won by an army of like-minded people that stick together and constantly look over each other's shoulders and looking out for one another and looking up for one another and praying for one another and standing in the gap for one another. But what had happened is these men had become distracted and their heart was not in the battle and God said, send them home. You know, I hope God never looks at me. And says that my life has become so entangled in worldly pursuits that I am no longer valuable to him in fighting this battle. Go ahead and send Dan home. That is the worst thing that a pastor could ever hear spoken over his life is that I've become so entangled in whatever it is that I've become entangled with that I'm no longer useful to God. Send him home. So what does Moses do? He gives some very detailed instructions about picking soldiers to fight in the army. And he says a really good soldier is passionate about the cause that he's fighting for. And he makes it clear that a good soldier understands the the, the tricks and the tactics of the enemy. That he understands that a good soldier does not run from the battle. He runs to the battle. You see, a really good soldier soldier is not a liability on the battlefield. He's an asset. Because he's not just watching out for himself. He's watching out for you too. You know, I saw a news clip recently. They, had, uh, they were talking about, you know, you know back when, in, in, like during World War II, if you went AWOL uh, in the military, I mean, you were really tarred and feathered when you got home. And, uh, you know, they're, they've become very, very lenient these days. I mean, I don't know what the minimum standards are anymore to get into the United States military. But I know this for a fact that they've become a lot easier on people to go AWOL in the military because they know for a fact that a guy that's in the battlefield that doesn't want to be there is not only not an asset, he's a complete liability. The first thing he does is he gives all the other guys around him a false sense of security. That's the first thing that goes wrong. The second thing that goes wrong is in the heat of the battle, you've got to babysit him. How many of you know a a battleground is not a good place to have to babysit somebody, amen? That's when you've got to have all the guys around you, they're all looking out for each other, they're looking over each other's shoulders, hey, we're in this together, gentlemen. And if any of us, you you know what I'm saying? Once we all start looking out for each other, or for ourselves and not each other, we're probably going to all walk out of here dead. You know, uh, you know, 10 years ago, I would never have said this. 
But, uh, you know, I used to believe that everybody should, uh, how do I say this? Let me just put it to you this way. You know, uh, I think everybody is called to this battle called Christianity, and it's a war we have to win. And, you know, there's a war for our soul. There's a battle for our soul. But I know for a fact that not everybody makes a good soldier on the front lines. You know, in the military, for every one guy on the front lines, there are seven more people that are working behind the scenes to coordinate that effort, to make sure that that man has ammunition, to make sure he's got water, to make sure he's got supplies, to make sure his vehicle is running, et cetera, et cetera. But it's a one to seven ratio. For every one person on the front lines, there are seven people, more people working behind the scenes. When I was a young Christian, I used to think that everybody had to get out on the front lines and fight this battle like a pastor or an evangelist or a missionary. Oh, no, no, I no longer believe that anymore at all, ladies and gentlemen. I realize that there's a lot of people that your personality and your character and your temperament and your giftedness, you're not wired up to be on the front lines. But the thing we need to understand is that that is okay. Because the only way the guy on the front lines can succeed is if he's got people on the rear guard that are looking out for him. So if you don't feel called to the front lines, that's totally okay. But here's, well, here's the thing. You can't, you, you, you can't just disconnect from the process and not do anything. Figure out what it is that God wants you to do behind the scenes and do it with all your might. Because what this whole chapter is all about is people who had become disenchanted with the battle. And they had become distracted by too many things around them. And consequently, they were no good for anything. And God said, send them home. And trust me, God, you don't ever want God to say that over your life. If you're taking notes this morning, number one, the very first soldier that Moses describes there in verse 5 is what I call the preoccupied soldier. The officer shall say to the army, has anyone built a new house and not yet begun to live in it? Let him go home or he may die in battle and someone else may begin to live in his house. You know, uh, I've only ever owned one house in my life. I think you've heard part of this story before. But uh, back in 1999, we built a house. And for those of you who have never had the privilege of going through uh, such a challenging, exhilarating character-building experience as building a house, uh, trust me, you haven't missed anything in life. Uh, It was about lost my sanctification over this thing. But, you know, it... uh, but, you know, the thing is, is you know, we, and we, we set this thing. Me and my wife did a few things, right? We said we're only going to incur this much debt, so we borrowed that much money. We finished as much of the house as we could for the amount of money that we borrowed, and we moved into the basement, which was all we could afford to do at the time. So, and we kind of knew, too, if we didn't finish that basement up front, it'd probably never get finished. So we finished it and moved in and lived in there for a couple of years and moved to the next level of two or three years later. And then two or three years after that, we found. But it was a seven, oh, it was a over seven years it took us to completely finish that house. And trust me, when we finally got that house finished, the only thing on your mind is to move into that thing, plant some furniture there, and hopefully drop one, draw one little bit of enjoyment out of this thing. After all the work and all the crazy decisions and all the hoopla that you have to go through to get a house from point A to point B, can I move in and just sit my lazy boy there and just draw one moment of joy out of this thing? You know, this is exactly what Moses was talking about here in this chapter. He's talking about a young man who had built a house, who had been called to the battle lines, and his mind wasn't there. You know, uh, during the whole process of uh, building this house, I was uh, still in and out of uh, ministry. I wasn't full-time in ministry, but I was filling in at several different churches. And let me just tell you this. It doesn't take a lot to really distract a guy from God's primary call over his life. Now understand, God doesn't expect you to live in a grass hut. This is Iowa. It's hot in the summer. It freezes in the winter. And and God knows that. He understands that. And even Jesus said, you know, you have a heavenly father that knows you need food and raiment. And God is more than eager to provide those things for you. But I tell you something. Let me ask him, what really has your attention this morning? What really has your heart? What really has your mind? What What are you consumed in this morning? It's okay to have a nice house. But if your whole life revolves around just getting that thing finished, that thing is out of balance in your life. And trust me, folks, I'm not standing here all high and mighty saying I've never been there. I've been there. I've only really made one financial mistake in my life. And that house, that, that, maybe someday I'll tell you the whole story. But I will just tell you this. 
When you're in the middle of something like that, that's all that you see in life. And God speaks to you and says, go on a missions trip. Can't do it. Do this, can't do it. Do that, can't do it. Why? Because your whole life is focused in on that one thing that you're, quote, trying to finish. And it is so easy to become distracted. It's so easy to be disconnected from the whole process of what God really has called you to do because you got yourself into the middle of something that maybe God didn't really tell you to get in the middle of. It just sounded like a good idea at the time. And I would just say to any young people here, and young people, I know your big dream in life is to have a nice big fancy house someday. Well, that's all fine and dandy, but let me tell you something. You can hang yourself on a house to the point to where you have nothing else in life to live for because you're feeding that stupid monster. You know, I'm 51 years old. One of the best things I got going for me in life is I'm totally out of debt. You know, I understand I I don't own a house. I rent this little uh, acreage out there. But at 51 years of age, I'm totally okay with getting up and not having a house payment. And it's because of the way I've kind of positioned my life, I feel like I can really focus on what God's called me to do. Now, understand, don't go home Monday morning and everybody call the bank and I'm selling the house. and I'm get, don't, don't do that. You've got to do what God's asking you to do. But here's my point. At every point in somebody's life, you've got to figure out what God really wants you to do, and you've got to reposition your life to be able to do that. Point number two. You know, the second kind of soldier that he talks about here in verse 6 is what he talks about. He says the intoxicated soldier is what I would call He says, has anyone planted a vineyard and not begin to enjoy it? Let him go home where he may die in battle and someone else will enjoy it. You know, this vineyard that this guy planted, you know what that's symbolic of? It's symbolic of being in charge of your own destiny. Planting a vineyard was not a job working for someone else. This was a business that he started. It was probably his first step as an entrepreneur in life. And uh, having just started his own business, and all of a sudden he gets called out to war, and he says, wait a minute, you know, every nickel I can pull out of this thing belongs to me. This is not a job. This is a business. I just started this thing, and i got to go off and fight. And you know what God says? God says, you think you got your life all figured out, don't you? What if you get called up for active duty, then what? Do you understand this whole chapter is all about prioritizing your life so you are free to serve the Lord? You know, my dad, I forget what year it was, but, you know, when he got drafted in the Korean War, all he got was a letter that said, congratulations, buddy, you're in the United States Army. There comes a time in every man's life when you have to figure out what's really important in life and you have to put everything else in the back burner and say, okay, God, I am totally at your disposal. Whatever it is that you want to do with me, I am ready to go. Even though I just planted a vineyard, even though I just started a business, even though I just built a house or whatever it was, that, you know, whatever it is that I think I'm supposed to do with my life, God, I am totally at your disposal for you to call me on my name at any point and say, let's go. You know, I... Uh, I'm on these news feeds on the internet that send me this kind of stuff, and it's always... But somebody sent me a story. I didn't know a whole lot about this guy. But last week, there was a story in USA Today. You know, you know who a guy by the name of Daryl Strawberry is? Yeah, he is a... Oh, help me, Nick. Well, who did he play baseball for? Mets, okay. Well, he's a pastor now. And you know one of the things they said about this guy... In this article they wrote about him, they said, if you walk into his house, there is no baseball paraphernalia anywhere in the guy's home. And he said, it's not that I don't love the game. I totally love the game. He said, the game is great. It was good to me. It gave me a platform. It launched me into ministry. It kind of, you know, everybody knows who Daryl Strawberry is. And what did they say about this guy? They said 335 home runs, uh, four World Series rings, and eight all-star appearances. But you know what he said? He said, the the reason I don't have any baseball paraphernalia in my home is because I knew I had to break my whole... Not that there's anything wrong with the game. But I've got a whole new life now. I'm a pastor now. And baseball is not my game anymore. He said, the Word of God is my game. He goes on to say here in this one thing, he said, it is so much fun being a pastor, seeing people's lives changed by the power of God. You know, I I try to get to the uh, county jail once a week down there and Florinda. And believe me, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of Fridays I drive away shaking my head saying, well, Lord, I did my best. I tried to plant a seed, but, you know, honestly, in my heart of hearts, it, you know, I hope that wasn't a waste of time. But, you know, you never know. You never know, and that's why I keep going back. And last Friday, I had a real grand slam moment. 
You just never know. You know, they shuttle those guys in and out, and I walk in, and everybody there that day was so receptive, and they wanted to hear what I had to say, and there was one young man that come walking out, and just, you know, it's hard to explain that even when somebody's standing there with prison clothes on, you can see leadership potential in that person. You know how the Holy Spirit can just show you that? And there was a young man came walking out of the cell. He came walking up to the bars there, and he looked like he was about 30 years old. And I asked him his name, and we, we began to dialogue a little bit. And this guy just had leadership potential written all over him. And I asked him, I said, let me ask you, let's start right at the very beginning. I said, have you ever really accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior? Have you ever really repented of your sins? And asked, uh, you know, just, just really asked him to come into your life and start a whole new life. He said, I wouldn't even know where to begin. And I said, well, we're going to begin right here. And I said, take, reach to the bars. I took this guy by the hands and we began to pray. And I really felt something real electric kind of go through me and this brother here. And I, I opened up the Bible to Revelation you know, 21, I showed him any name that is not written in the book of life is cast into the lake of fire. But any name that is written in the book of life. And I said, do you realize right now, brother, your name just got written into the book of life up in heaven? Yeah. Amen, amen. Yeah. But you know, that going back to what Daryl Strawberry said, it is, it is just so much fun to, to be a pastor. Sometimes I stand there in a moment like that and I say to myself, I can't believe they actually paid me for doing this. You know, I'd do this for free. I really would. It is so much fun. How much, how much better does it get than that, man? Be able to see somebody come to Christ for the very first time, to see a man's countenance, to see everything inside of him just change all of a sudden. The Holy Spirit moves into his life, and the guy's just transformed like that. You see, the, the intoxicated soldier is a guy that throws all of his emotional energy into making his vineyard work because he's addicted to what the vineyard produces, whether it's money or fame or recognition. Let me ask you this. What are you intoxicated with today? You sit there, you say, I'm not intoxicated with nothing. I didn't have anything before I came to church. Oh, well, yeah, you're, you're intoxicated with something today. It might not be, you know, Jim Beam. I hope it isn't. But you're intoxicated with something today. There's something today that you're addicted to. There's something that has a hold of your heart, that has a hold of your mind, that has a hold of a better portion of your life. What is it? Moses said, you know what God said? God said, the only thing you can do with an intoxicated soldier is send him home. He's no good. Number three is what we call the broken-hearted soldier. You know what it says there in verse 7. Has anyone become pledged to a woman and not married her? Let him go home or he may die in battle and somebody else will marry her instead. You know, I, as much as I understand what God's saying here, I, you know, you don't ever want to disagree with God, right? But a soldier, if I was that soldier that was pledged to be married... How many things would I have in my mind? Well, besides the obvious, I would probably only have one other thing in my mind. I hope she doesn't find somebody else when I'm gone. Right? Besides the obvious, what else would you have in your mind besides that? And you know, I uh, could only imagine what it's like to be serving overseas and you're sitting there and in the back of your mind, all you can ask yourself over and over and over is, I wonder if she's staying true. The thought of her being with someone else is about all I can take. And his head is not in the game because his heart is not in the game. And now he's yearning for her affirmation, and he sits there at what they call mail call, and he anxiously awaits for his name to be called. And, oh, I got a letter from back home, and with a trembling hand, he opens that letter up, and he realizes, ah, she hasn't forgotten about me. And yet, you know, as good as that story sounds, God says, if that's all the guy does is sit and think about that all day long, send him home. I understand he's homesick. I understand he's in love. But if you can't focus on the battle, send him home. You know, I'll tell you something. One One of the dynamics I have to struggle with all my life as a pastor is I love my wife. I love my kids. But I also know I have other responsibilities in life. 
And you know, sometimes, sometimes a family can be a great covering to shirk those other responsibilities that you have. They are not your only responsibility. They are your primary responsibility, but you still have other responsibilities in life, don't you? You know, I, uh, I don't know if you remember about a month or two ago, we had a couple of uh, missionaries here, this Jay and Jackie Luthro, they were missionaries to China. And, you know, when you go out and eat with a missionary afterwards, you always get to pick his brains and ask questions. That's the funnest part of the whole thing. But we were sitting there, and we were talking about, I said, explain to me what it's like to run a Bible college in China. What's that like? And we began to talk, and I said, let me ask you this, because, you know, the, the joke about North Central Bible, Bible College is it was actually called North Central Bridal College, okay? That's the big joke. Everybody goes there to get a, a man or a wife. But I asked him, I said, in China, when you go into Bible college in China, I said, Do the, are the kids allowed to date in the Bible college? He said, absolutely not. And he said, the reason is not because dating is wrong. It's not because falling in love is wrong. It's because in China, it takes so much sacrifice from so many different family members to get one kid to a Bible college. We do not let them ruin that by throwing them into a relationship that could possibly go sour. And for the four years, two years, whatever, for as long as they're here, you will focus on your studies and what God has called you to do. Now, when you're done, you're free to go and marry anybody you want to marry. But as long as you are here studying for the ministry, you will focus on what God has called you to do. That sounds a little heavy-handed, doesn't it? But what if, now just follow me, folks. This is China we're talking about here, folks. What if five people in your family, what if three uncles and two aunts all threw their life savings into a pot just to get you to Bible college? All of a sudden, that's a different story, isn't it? Now I see why they demand that level of commitment. Now I see why they don't allow you to be distracted when you're on the battlefield because you're preparing for something here. You know, uh, this whole idea of a broken-hearted soldier, you know, uh, you know every culture has its own unique language, right? You know what a military euphemism is called a jody? You know what Jody is in the military? You know what a Jody is? You know, and, and when you're in uh, basic training, they have these cadences. You've seen these on, on TV, you know, on, on, on movies. They, they have these cadences or these chants that they sing while they're running in basic training. You know, or the commander hollers something out and everybody else hollers it back. You know, you know. let me read you one here. I got a letter in the mail, go to war or go to jail. Sat me in that barber's chair, spun me around, I had no hair. Used to drive a limousine, now I'm wearing army green. Used to date a beauty queen, now I date my M16. Ain't no use in going back, cause Jody's got your Cadillac. Ain't no use in calling home, cause Jody's got your girl and gone. They took away my gin and rum, and now I'm up before the sun. Mama, mama, can't you see this army life is killing me? You know what that is? That's a broken hearted soldier. It's a guy's life that is unraveling, and there's nothing he can do about it. You know, I was doing some research on this, and this one guy wrote a, an article about this, and he says that most men who fought in Iraq and Afghanistan, he says they actually fought two wars. He said the one they fought over there and the one they fought 7,000 miles back home, uh, the one they really didn't have a lot of control over, trying to keep their marriages and their bank accounts together. This is an exact quote. He says, they all knew about Jody, the opportunist of Army folklore, folklore who moved in on a soldier's girlfriend while the soldier was out fighting. They sung hundreds of his cadences in basic training to writing the name, but it was always a joke because it was always the other guy it happened to. After serving the chaos of Iraq and Afghanistan, thousands of soldiers became casualties of a fight they were poorly trained for, keeping control of their family during the separation of war. Men and women who felt lucky to have survived just a few t fatalities in their units came back and knew dozens of people that returned to empty houses, squandered bank accounts, divorce papers, and restraining orders. He says, actually, at Fort Hood, he says, whenever a new deployment of people are coming home, they always hire additional staff. The broken-hearted soldier. You know what I know? If you were to ask me, what does a broken-hearted soldier look like? They kind of come in all shapes and sizes, don't they? The only thing they have in common is they were all hurt on the battlefield. Do you see the parallels that I'm trying to draw in here this morning? Let me tell you something about going to church. We've got a bunch of great people here. But you go to any church long enough, 
you'll get hurt on the battlefield, won't you? You'll get disappointed. You'll get offended. What do you do in that moment of time? Do you quit? Do you leave? Or do you understand that there are lessons that you learn on the battlefield that make you the soldier that God wants you to be? You work through it. You stick it out. And you don't quit. You know, I... uh, Do I want to go there? You know, let me just say this. One of the things I think that we as a church need to continue to work on is this whole issue of secondhand offenses. And if you have a problem with somebody, you need to go to that person. Ever go like this? Because let me tell you, let me tell you what a, what, let me tell you what a, uh, let me tell you what a, uh, a broken-hearted soldier looks like. When I was, uh, I, you know, I don't have to meet somebody for very long to know whether or not that person's been hurt on the battlefield. When I was filling in one time at a church in Knoxville, Iowa, There was a guy that he looked like he was about 10 years older than me. At the time, I was probably about 40, and he was probably about 50, 55. And uh, every Sunday morning when I would get up to preach, about the time the worship was done, I'd get up to preach. Him and his wife would come walking in and sit kind of about where Jack's sitting there this morning. And he would sit, and you could tell he would listen really attentively. And as soon as I went to close the, uh, the, the service and to pray, he was out the back door and gone. And this went on for about two or three months. And one Sunday, I told uh, uh, one of the senior elders there, a guy named Dave, I said, I want you to close the service this morning. I got something else planned. Just close the service for me. And I, on, I don't know, was this right or wrong? But anyway, I, I, I nodded to Dave. He came up to close the service for me. And I finally got this guy at the back door. And I said, you know, I know she's know been coming here for about three months. I said, I'm, I'm Pastor Dan. Hello. You know, I want to be your friend. Everything's okay here what's up? And he looked at me, he turned and looked at me, and he shook my hand, and he backed off, and he said, I like hearing you preach. I said, thank you. I said, well, what's your name? And he said, like, Bob, you want to tell me his whole name? And I said, well, Bob, I'm glad to finally have met you. And I can tell this guy didn't have nothing to do with me. And I went, whoo, and you can just feel the tension on this guy. I, we, I said goodbye. I walked back in the church, and everybody kind of looked at me like they knew what I'd done, and I said, what, what's, what's the story on him? He used to be a minister. That's what a broken-hearted soldier work, looks like, folks. I tried this, and it didn't work out for me. And you know, let me tell you something. You know, you know how I, I know whether someone is a broken-hearted soldier? Now, I know you're all going to be paranoid when I say this, but I just, I'm just going to say it. You know, one of the things that I watch as a pastor in this church is when church is done, I watch... And I see how long people stay when the service is over. And whether you want to admit it or not, that is a very accurate gauge of where someone is at in their spiritual life. Because I could tell you too many stories about too many people that I know personally that the minute that service was over, they about knocked the front door of the church down getting out. And you know what that is, folks? That's a brokenhearted soldier. I seriously, when I caught that guy at the back door that day and stuck my hand out, he stuck his hand out and leaned back. And I walked in the church and said, I, you, know, what, but, you know, what can I do for a guy like that? I extended him my hand of friendship. I'm here for you. I'd love to get to know you. He, he, just, he just pulled away. And when you walk up to somebody and you stick your hand out and that person pulls away from you, you know that person, is, that person has gotten hurt. But let me tell you something. If you've gotten hurt, if you've gotten hurt, you're in the best, best place in the world to get healed this morning. That's the good news, amen? You know, I want to say something else to you. You know what part of this chapter is all about? Is that God does not want you to walk through life beat up, defeated, and knocked out. He wants you to be victorious. Why do you think there's so much in the Bible about the battle lines and going to the battle and winning the battle and fighting the battle? It's because God wants you to win your battles. He didn't want you to walk through life defeated. If he wanted you to walk through life defeated, he wouldn't have sent Jesus to die for your sins, and he wouldn't have sent the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. He could have solved that problem real easy. Why do you think he did all that? Why do you think he sent his only begotten son to die for your sins? Why do you think he poured out the power of the Holy Spirit on the church on the day of Pentecost? Because he wanted us to lose? No, because he wanted us to win. The battles that you're facing in your life right now, do you think God wants you to lose those battles? Do you think he wants you to win those battles? He wants you to win every single one of them. He wants you to lose.
You know, the fourth uh, uh, soldier that Moses talks about here in verse 8. Then the officers shall add, is anyone afraid or faint-hearted? Let him go home so that his fellow soldiers will not be disheartened too. Now, you know, again, you know, it's, uh, it's easy to, look, to judge a guy like that and say, yeah, the guy was, he was afraid and faint-hearted, send him on home. You know, it's easy to judge and say man up. But you know what makes a man afraid or faint, faint-hearted? You know, I, uh, you know, I saw in the news, I was just watching the news last night with the kids, and there was a guy in Omaha that had been gone for two whole years over in Afghanistan. His wife was eight months pregnant when he, when he left, and uh, he just held his little girl for the very first time. You know, don't assume that God is talking about some guy here that's some big sissy. If that was me, I'd be weak and faint-hearted too, wouldn't you? But you know, let me throw something at you here. You know, I believe this world would so much would run so much better if we did things God's way. Did you even know this law was in the Bible? Let me read this to you. This is out of Deuteronomy chapter 24. If a man has recently married, he must not be sent to war or have any other duty laid upon him. For one year he is to be free to stay at home and bring happiness to the wife that he has married. Did you know that was even in the Bible? Do you believe the world would run a better way if we did things God's way and not our way? You know, let me throw something else at you here, too, about this, uh, what's going on in this text. I'm, I'll just throw this at you. I'll let you go home and debate this. This will be good discussion for Sunday afternoon dinner. You know, in Acts chapter 15, there's an interesting story in there about uh, Paul and, uh, and Barnabas. And you remember the little d- dispute they got into? What Paul wanted to do, Paul wanted to retrace his steps from his first missionary journey and revisit all the churches they planted and see how they were doing. They got to talking about this, and uh, Paul said, yeah, and one other thing, too, he said, uh, no, Barnabas wanted to bring uh, a guy named John Mark. And uh, Paul said, no way. There's no way in the world I'm going to bring that guy because he, uh, he deserted us on a previous missionary trip, so we're not taking him. And the dispute got so intense that uh, Paul took uh, – I'm drawing a blank here, sorry. But Paul took uh, – uh, uh, yeah, Barnabas took uh, Mark and went his own way, and uh, Paul took Silas. That's, that's the word I was looking for, Silas, the name, Silas. So they went their separate ways. Now, the only saving grace out of that is because they split their missionary teams up, more people heard the gospel. But, you know, here, let me throw something at you, though. For Paul and, and Barnabas to have that hot of a dispute over something like that, whether or not you're going to take a guy with you like that on, on the next missionary journey, we could probably have an interesting discussion here this morning, couldn't we, as to which one of those guys heard from God and which one was reacting in the flesh. Were they both right? How could two men both be right on something like that? I mean, obviously, John Mark was supposed to go on this missionary trip, or he wasn't. And Paul and Barnabas had such an intense debate about this, they split their missionary team up. Which one of those guys was right? Which one was in the flesh? I don't know, but let me throw this at you. This verse right here. Is a man afraid or faint-hearted? Let him go home. Why? So that his brothers do not become weak and faint-hearted also. Do you think maybe that's the verse that Paul was acting on when he said John Mark is not going to come with us on another missionary trip? We brought him once. He was weak. He was faint-hearted, and he quit. We're not bringing him on another one. Do you think that's the verse that Paul was possibly referencing when he made his decision? I don't know. You know, uh, I was doing some research on this. This is a, you know, back in the year 2004, British Columbia, Canada, drew up some plans to build an official draft Dodger memorial to honor the 125,000 men who fled Canada between 1964 and 75. And then, of course, in 1977, Jimmy Carter granted amnesty to all the Vietnam vets. A draft Dodger Memorial, who would have ever thunk of it, right? A draft Dodger Memorial. Do you think there's going to be a draft Dodger Memorial in heaven? No. Jesus said, be faithful unto me unto death, and I'll give you the crown of life. There will be no draft Dodger Memorial in heaven, folks. You know, in the book of Revelation, you know, John talks about the the cowards that that, that, that end up on the lake of fire. And when he, talk, when he uses that word coward, he's not talking about that natural human fear that you would have when you encounter a situation you've never encountered before. 
What John's talking about there, the coward he's talking about there, is a man that had a hundred opportunities to stand for Christ in the marketplace, but because he loved the praise of many, jellyfished every single time. I know I've asked you this before, but when you stand there amongst the guys in the marketplace and somebody tells a disgusting joke, do you laugh? I hope you don't. And I certainly hope you don't tell them. You know, I've had that experience many times in my life where I've been standing there in a group of guys and somebody will crack a filthy joke, I just look the other way. It's called taking a stand for Christ. I'm going to close with this. Do you know this, the way this closes out? You know, in verse 9, let's go back and reread verse 9. When the officers have finished, finished speaking to the army, they shall appoint commanders over it. You know what's interesting about this is that God said, after the sifting process is over, after you know who the, uh, the preoccupied soldiers are, and uh, the, uh, you know, the disconnected soldiers, the disenchanted soldiers, and the, the unfocused soldiers, and whatever else. He says, now you pick your leaders. Now you pick your leaders. You don't pick your leaders first. You wait and see who sticks it out in the heat of the battle and who doesn't. You know, some of you I know have, have, have uh, indicated to me that you'd love to be in some kind of ministry. You know what God is watching in your life right now? He's seeing who gets disconnected in the heat of the battle and who doesn't. And at the end of that process, he'll pick his leaders. Do you realize the only reason, one of the main reasons I stand before you today is your pastor? It's because God's, God's thrown me in the middle of the battlefield on many, many occasions. And I must have did good enough. I must have did good enough to get asked to come down here and do this. It wasn't perfect. But I obviously did a good enough job. I passed the test enough that he asked me to come down here and be your pastor. Would you like to be in ministry someday? Would you like to be on the front lines? Well, God's watching you right now to see whether you're disconnecting on the battlefield, whether you're diving, whether you're running to the battle lines like David did and saying, bring it on. And everything that's going on in your life right now is a test to see whether or not you're worthy to be called to the front lines. Everybody go like this. You want to be used of God in a greater way? Well, you've got to t- pass the test you're going through today. Let's all bow our hearts before the Lord. Lord Jesus, as we come to the close of this service, dear God, Lord, we thank you for this challenging word, God, that you put in Deuteronomy chapter 20. And God, we want to take from here this morning, God, we want to take from here the lesson, Lord, that if we want to ever end up on the front lines, Lord, in ministry, God, we've got to pass the test, Lord, of how we react in the battleground. And God, if we become weak, if we become faint-hearted, God, if we become, God, disconnected and unfocused, God, and broken-hearted, Lord, And hold on to things, Lord, that we need to let go of, God, that we're never going to get called to the front lines. So, Lord, we lay our hearts, God, we lay our mind, we lay our lives before you again today, God. And we ask, Lord Jesus, God, that you would recreate in us, God, that heart, that mind, God, that that, that, that mindset of a warrior, God, that you want us to have, Lord. And God, again, help us to understand, Lord, that this battle, Lord, what we've been called to fight, Lord, is an issue of eternal life and eternal death, God. It's the difference between heaven and hell. For the Lord would say to you today, stop fighting this battle in your own strength. I am your helmet. I am your shield. I am your buckler. I am your spear. I am your breastplate of righteousness. I am your sword. The Lord would say to you, look to me today and stop fighting this battle in your own strength and in your own flesh and look unto me, says the Lord. 
Forsake the things that have tangled up your heart. Forsake the things. Walk away from those things that you've become too attached to, the things that distract you from serving me. And if you will come to me and serve me with a whole heart, you will not have to fight your battles, but I will fight those battles for you. Stand still and see the salvation of your God. You know, if everyone just continue your heads bowed, I, I've never done this before, but if you're sitting here this morning and you're fighting a battle, could you just make eye contact with me? Just raise your hand. Lord Jesus, we, we lift these people up right now, Lord. God, that have identified themselves, Lord, as being in the middle of a battle. And God, I pray more than anything, God, that you would just, God, that you would just pour into them today, God, your wisdom, God, that they would know what to do, God, by the leading of your Holy Spirit. And God, I just pray, God, I pray that your peace, God, would surround them, Lord Jesus, that they would understand, Lord, that they have not been called to fight this battle by themselves, God, but they've been called to fight this battle, God, with your strength. And God, we dispatched, God, we just dispatched, Lord, a thousand legions of angels this morning, Lord Jesus, to go forth, Lord, and to do, God, what only you can do, God. And Lord, we know that your word says that having done all that a man can do, stand. And so, God, we stand here this morning, God, Lord, knowing that we've done what we could do, God. We've petitioned you, God. We, we've asked for your help, God. And we've laid our life before you. But, God, now we ask you to do, God, what only you can do over our lives, Lord. And, God, we thank you for that peace, God, that the Holy Spirit gives, Lord Jesus, when we align ourselves, God, with your perfect will. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. The Lord would also say to you today that part of this battle that you're fighting is in your quiet time with me. Come away with me to a lonely place, to a quiet place. And let us reason together, says the Lord. Do not forsake me in the quiet places. Do not forsake me in the dim hours of the night and the morning. For part of this battle that you're fighting is about my time with you. The Lord would say to you, turn off the things in your life that distract you. Put away those things that constantly pull at your heart and your mind and focus on me. The Lord would ask you to make him a, prior, a priority in your life. There's someone sitting here this morning. The Lord's been dealing with you. You just watch too much television in life. The Lord says to turn that thing off. Open up my word. Seek my face.
the Lord would say to you today that I've called you to be a different people. You're going to be a light and a witness in a dark world. You're not to live your life the way the world does. You're to be different. You're to be called out, set apart, separated, holy. You do not do everything that the world does. In my word, I told you that you are to, to discern between the clean and the unclean, between the common and the profane. Do not watch things that are unclean. Do not watch things that are profane. Fill your mind with good things, says the Lord. There, there's someone sitting here this morning that when you came into church this morning, you were excessively heavy in heart. You were just as sad as you've been in a long time. And the Lord wants to just take the sadness out of your heart right now. And he wants to replace it with his joy. Let's uh, have our ushers come forward and distribute the communion elements.